fire brigade is called out to a blaze in a suburban house. What they discover is more than arson. A brutal crime has been concealed, but the clues remaining would lead investigators to uncover a 10-year murder spree. We found a bunker under this floor and there were a large number of bones under there. We're thinking, you know, here's something that we've got to jump on as quickly as we can. He called himself the mechanic and that he'd committed a number of other murders. His first shot hit him between the eyes and he was proud of that fact. She was still saying, don't kill me. And then I heard like a, a gargling noise. It was quite chilling actually. We were wondering whether we were seeing the murder weapon in the vehicle. The brutality and the senselessness of it all. I've never worked on a case like it. When blokes get together for a drink in a pub, they can often be fancy with the facts. Like the hole-in-one they scored last Sunday, or the big one that got away that morning. It's brushed off as a bit of manly bravado. But what if the tale was one of multiple murder? When firefighters first arrived, they found a large volume of smoke coming out of this building. They found that the front door was closed and locked, so they kicked it open. As they went in, they searched through different rooms to see if they could find any people that might be trapped. One of them went into a room which was like a lounge room, and he found a woman sitting on a lounge in that room. There was no fire in the room, but she appeared to him to be deceased. The other firefighter who went down towards the back of the building, when he got to the end of the hallway, he found a large room which was an office which was totally involved in fire. And as he stepped into that room, he found the body of a woman laying on the floor. And he believed that there was a possibility that this woman may still be alive. So he dragged the body halfway up the hallway and it was only at that stage that he saw that she had some horrific injuries and that she was dead. So they both went back down the hallway to make sure the fire didn't spread anywhere in the building. After a triple O emergency call, fire crews arrived at Kerry's relaxation centre to find a blaze in a back room. As they put out the flames, a grim discovery. Inside the building were two fatalities. The uh, fire was quickly extinguished and the cause of the fatalities and the cause of the fire is under investigation. The premises were called Kerry's Oasis and it was advertised as being a reflexology health spa, which I think are probably fancy words for a massage parlour. The two victims inside and the crime scene evidence surrounding them were giving police a strong indication of what had taken place. Victim one in the front room appeared not to have struggled at all and in fact I would go so far as to say that that particular victim didn't even see it coming. She had a gunshot wound in the right cheek and a gunshot wound in the right neck and there was a gunshot wound in the right temple that showed a muscle abrasion which indicates that the gun was held in contact with the skin when it was fired. The fact that she was sitting in a napping position on the couch and looking at the way the blood had run down the front only says that either she had been talking to the offender when she was shot and wasn't expecting anything to happen, to walk straight into the room, shot her and then walked straight out again. That person has then possibly gone out of that uh, front room and had an altercation with victim number two and discharged a further three shots in the vicinity of the hallway towards the reception room. Inside the reception area, two walls had sustained bullet impact damage and a humidifier had also been completely penetrated by what appeared to be a bullet. 
We also found some groceries. We found a can of baked beans that had a dent in it. We found some newspaper that had blood on it. It was reasonably obvious that there'd been some sort of gun battle or event had taken place in that room. Down the hallway, there was an amount of blood smearing up on both sides of the hallway. There was a water cooler which had been knocked over, which once again suggests that a struggle occurred in that hallway. While her body had been dragged by firefighters into the hallway, victim number two had made it to the far room. A pool of blood remained at the place she died. There were some obvious cuts on the face and neck. There was quite a lot of damage to the face, which usually indicates somebody who's got a fair degree of dislike for the person. She also had the gunshot wound in the right eye, and I think it was probably the finishing shot. So both of the victims had been finished off with fairly close range gunshot wounds. It looks like um, an execution. One of the victims was discovered near the office. She'd been stabbed, her throat slashed. Police believe she's the 40-year-old manageress. Her 52-year-old de facto husband collapsed in shock after being told she was dead. It was explained to him that he couldn't go in because it was a crime scene and firefighters grabbed hold of him uh, to stop him from going in there and at that point he collapsed onto the street and we immediately called for an ambulance to come and tend to him. As he was taken to hospital, detectives looked at his car that had been abandoned on the street. And when you opened the sliding door of the white Tarago, there was what appeared to be a lever action rifle and a gun case immediately inside the door. The case was partially opened and blood was seen on the lining of the case and also the case itself. Obviously, uh, a firearm so close to a double murder is highly suspicious, especially when there's blood on the gun case. Clearly, he knew the people that were in the house, and as a matter of course, we, we had to speak to him. Post-mortems have confirmed that two murdered women were the victims of a frenzied attack in a Sydney massage parlour. The killer set out to destroy as much evidence as he could, but the flames did not spread quickly enough to hide the secrets of his horrific crime. A post-mortem has still managed to reveal that 40-year-old Kerry Pang and Fatima Ozanal, 26, were brutally murdered. Pang had been stabbed numerous times, her throat had been cut, um, and she had sustained a gunshot wound. Uh, Ozanol had been shot a number of times. Kerry and her employee Fatima, also known as Nikki, had been shot by a .22 firearm. So when detectives discovered a gun matching the description in the boot of Kerry's de facto's car, they needed to speak with him. Mark Lewis had been released from hospital after being treated for shock. You're aware now, aren't you, that uh, Kerry and uh, the other girl, Nikki, um, uh, were murdered? You told me they were shot, yes. yes. Do you have any knowledge about that at all? No, sir. Would you care to tell me what your movements were this afternoon after 5pm? As I mentioned to you before, I started watching news at 5 o'clock, and it's a 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock news. And probably 10 past, quarter past five, the phone went, so I turned the TV down. I picked it up and just my normal mind, and I said, um, they are people can I help you? In the interview, Mr Lewis told us that he'd um, received a death threat um, for Kerry at his premises at West Ride. He was uh, also operating a massage parlour in West Ride, which is a neighbouring suburb to Gladesville. And the male voice um, said that there were to the effect, um, I'm going to kill your girlfriend. She doesn't deserve to live like that. Something to that effect. And Dan went to receive her. And I said, oh, prickhead, you know. Um, just a crank call, so I put it down. And I sat back, and I went to put the TV back on. I felt funny in the stomach. Um, it, it bothered me, when normally crank calls don't bother me. And it was the voice. And it, it put it like a, a sort of a chill down my back. It, I just didn't feel right. Uh, Mr Lewis, have you received any other similar phone calls to the one you received yeah. yesterday afternoon? 
Um, in the last 12 months, we've probably had six to ten threats by phone. Some are male, some are female. Some people think I'm a bastard, some think that Kerry's a bitch, some people think, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, nasty people. Uh, he probably do too, but, you know, we're usually just normal people trying to make money to pay the bills and keep ahead, that's all. After receiving this threat, he told us he called Kerry and then she left the place at Gladesville, came to West Ride and spoke to him about it. And I said, mate, they threatened you. you know? I told her what was said. And she said, I haven't hurt anybody. I don't know anybody who, you know. Because um, over the years we have lots of problems with girls and husbands and all that, but nothing major. So uh, she said, oh, well, I'll ring her Dick Lesbury. And she rang the Ride detectives because she had Dick's number with her. And uh, they said, he's not here, he's a chat with and she said he's not there, but I've left him as he's on his hands up home. And then Mark has accompanied her back to her premises at Gladesville. I drove down the Gladesville, and just as you come down the Gladesville one pit water ladder, I think there's a little shop there. The place is soft and went in the shop, and she walked around and she got a loaf of bread, and she picked up a couple of tins of something. Um, she got in her car, I got in my car, we just drove around the corner, parked in the car park, we walked through the Gladesville door. Kissed a good night, according to him, and uh, he'd returned to the premises at West Ride. Do you recall what time that was that you uh, got through the door and left? The phone call came probably about quarter past five. She was probably up there at half past five, quarter to six, something like that. So we'd have been down there at six, quarter past. And then returned to his parlour at uh, West Ride, arriving about 7pm. Uh, we also spoke to him about the rifle that had been found in his Tarago. Would you explain to me or describe to me that firearm? It's a Winchester 22. Mr Lewis told us that when he was dropping Kerry off at the massage parlour, uh, Kerry had wished to take the firearm that was in the back of the Tarago with her for self-defence. I said, no, you don't really want to rock. And that was it, so I just left it in the car, threw it on the floor and back again. Could you tell me how many .22 caliber rifles you owned? I couldn't really have done it. Probably three or four or five, I'm not 100% certain. Yeah. Ballistics expert Ray Grimmer had looked at the eight cartridges and four intact bullets collected from the crime scene. Under the microscope, he determined that they were all discharged from one firearm. Now he was testing all of Mark Lewis's guns, eight in total, to see if one of them was the murder weapon. Each weapon is test fired on three occasions. Firing! So that we could recover three fired bullets and three fire cartridge cases. And this is done in a water recovery tank within our section. Once the fire cartridge cases and the fire bullets are recovered, I then compare the surfaces of those bullets and fire cases to the surfaces of the exhibit fire cases and fire bullets from the crime scene. As a result of this, I was able to eliminate those eight firearms as being responsible for the incident that occurred at Gladesville. With the guns eliminated, police turned to the death threat. The crime scene and autopsy had suggested that Kerry was the likely target. And it appears she took the death threat mentioned by her de facto seriously enough to call the police. Hi, can I have um, Dick Ledford call me urgently? 018-257-657. It's Kerry Pang. Thank you. She got one bloke that has been coming backwards and forwards now for about, I suppose, six months. We call him Fred Flintstone because he's got a square head. He used to be one of our customers at Paramount. He roughed up one of our girls at one stage. He is notorious. He rings Kerry and me three or four times a week. Who's on that and disguises his voice? You know, um, and all this sort of shit. Right. And we got a, a problem last week with a girl uh, when she was leaving, and uh, she threatened Kerry and myself. When police tracked down and spoke with disgruntled clients and employees, all had alibis. But it was Mark Lewis's whereabouts they were now interested in. The phone call to the detective had brought up a discrepancy in Lewis's story, one that put him back in the spotlight. Mr Lewis's times were about an hour out, those he'd been giving us, which put him in the vicinity 
of the murders. Eight guns belonging to him eliminated as the murder weapon involved in the death of his de facto Kerry and her employee. But 57-year-old Lewis was still firmly in the police sights. Would you care to tell me firstly about your relationship with Kerry Payne? Kerry and I lived together in a de facto relationship. We've had a de facto relationship now on and off for four, four years. I broke up my marriage three and a half years ago after 32 years, and during the last three and a half years we spent 99% of that time together. I think a week here and a week there we might have been apart. And even when we were living apart, we are still sleeping in the same bed going to each other's house. We spoke to a lot of friends and associates of both people. There were suggestions of infidelity on the part of Kerry. There were suggestions of a fairly insane jealousy on the part of uh, Mark Lewis. There certainly were financial problems between them. There were uh, professional problems between them. So the relationship wasn't as smooth and as loving as Mr Lewis described in his interview. With that knowledge, police began to scrutinise his version of events. Do you recall what time that was that you got her at the door and left? The phone call came probably about quarter past five. She was probably up there about half past five, quarter to six, something like that. So we'd have been down there at six, quarter past. It was true Kerry had gone to her de facto's massage parlour at West Ride and she had made a call to the police. Hi, can I have um, Dick Ledford call me urgently? It's Kerry Pang. Thank you. But telephone records and one of Mark Lewis's employees put her there at 6.45pm, not 5.45pm, as Lewis had claimed. I had not butterflies in my stomach, but I felt funny in the stomach. She said, well, how about we take Chris back to Glazeville and we'll close West Ride. I said, yeah, that's a good idea. Chris, who was Mark Lewis's worker, decided to stay. She told the police that the two left at 7pm in separate cars and that Kerry had called her just before she reached the massage parlour. Phone records confirming it was 7.18pm. Do you recall what time that was that you got her at the door and left? So we'd have been down there at 6, quarter past. Only 12 minutes later, the firefighters were called. Kerry and her employee were already dead. Now, in Lewis's account, by 7.30 p.m., he had already been back at his business for half an hour. After you left Gladesville, where did you go? And what time, approximately, do you think that you arrived back there? That's what I said. Looking for the news. Would have been about... The woman working at the West Ride massage parlour with Lewis on the night told us that um, he'd returned about 8pm from Kerry's place. It indicated that uh, Mr Lewis's times were about an hour out from those that he'd been giving us, which put him in the vicinity of the murders, pretty close to the time that they may have occurred. Then there was the rifle bag and Mark Lewis's clothes that were removed for evidence on the night of the murder. On the shirt and the shorts and the shoes, I found very small areas of staining, which a preliminary test then tested positive for blood. I also tested the rifle bag and on a number of areas on the outside for very small stains. And inside, there were also small stains which could have been blood. So the samples were sent for DNA testing and the DNA profile from Mark Lewis's shorts matched Kerry. And the profile recovered from the outside of the rifle bag also matched Kerry. But on his shirt, there was a mixture of DNA which indicated to us that there was DNA from more than one individual, most likely two people. One was Kerry's, the other was unknown. It could have been Mark Lewis's. It may have belonged to someone else. 
We had to remember, of course, that Kerry was Mr Lewis's partner. She travelled regularly in the vehicle and obviously regularly had close contact with him. So evidence of her blood on his clothing in the amounts that it was there were not suggestive by themselves that he was involved directly in the murder. Certainly something didn't smell right about him, but there wasn't enough to um, go around accusing him of a murder at that stage. Can you tell me what your association both past, past and present with Lindsay Rose has been? Then, two years later, a breakthrough. Well, I've known Lindsay for about 10 years now. Uh, I just met him as initially just as a you know, drinking companion. Here you go, mate. We had an informant Cheers, that we trusted, Cheers. that we were confident was giving us reliable information. And he told us that he was speaking to Lindsay Rose and Lindsay Rose had told him that he had committed a number of murders. When police put Lindsay Rose's name through their computer, they discovered the 41-year-old had only some minor criminal charges. Yet here he was in a pub, bragging about having committed a double murder on Valentine's Day. Lindsay Rose was saying that the husband of the woman that actually owned the parlour had paid him $20,000 to do a professional hit on her and made sure she was killed. But as police were to find out, Lindsay Rose had only just begun to tell his story. Task Force Yandy had been set up to re-examine a number of unsolved murders in New South Wales. As a result of their investigations, they were given a lead for one cold case. An informant told detectives that the Valentine's Day murders were the result of a professional hit. Mark Lewis had apparently hired Lindsay Rose to kill his de facto wife. Now it turns out that Lindsay Rose and Mark Lewis were, were quite good friends. They had had a working relationship and a friendship over many years. Mark Lewis had a number of companies and Lindsay Rose worked for Mark Lewis on repossessions and security. With that link established, police approached Mark Lewis. He refused to be interviewed, would not answer any questions. So if police wanted to prove Mark Lewis had ordered the hit, then they needed to put Lindsay Rose at the crime scene. The physical evidence that had been preserved was re-examined starting with Mark Lewis's shirt that had the DNA mixture upon it. We could not discount that the blood on the shirt may have been Lindsay Rose's. The, the struggle with the victim, Kerry, was very violent, so we needed to know his blood type. We were able to make some investigations and the blood group that Lindsay had was ABRH negative, which is a very, very rare blood grouping. That blood grouping was not found in the mix but there was slightly better luck on the ballistics front. The informant had told us that Lindsay gave him the gun and the informant said that he sold the gun to a mate that wanted a gun for protection. He was able to tell us who that person was and we executed a search warrant on his premises and we found a 22 caliber target pistol with a homemade silencer. Firing. We had it ballistically tested, but it was inconclusive the ballistics expert could only say that it was similar and we couldn't prove beyond doubt that that was the murder weapon. We then come to the nose piece from the eyeglasses that was found at the scene. This small yet significant item was found in the hallway outside the reception area where the gun battle had taken place. While Mark Lewis's eyewear was intact on the night, police now had another suspect. We knew Lindsay Rose wore glasses and because we found the nose piece, we were pretty sure that the glasses would have been damaged. We then interviewed every optometrist in the area where Lindsay lived. And lo and behold, three days after the murders, an optometrist gives us a card where a person named Lindsay Rose had put his glasses in to be repaired. Lindsay's actually signed the card and it was his signature. It's a tiny piece, but when you get all the tiny pieces of evidence coming together, it becomes crucial. So he was brought into the police centre and he was interviewed. He denied any implication in the murders. He said he knew about them, but told us that the informant that we were using was the person who had committed the murders 
and that another person called Donnie had done the murders with him. Detectives believed their informant wasn't involved. But could this Donnie be more than just a name? Had Lindsay Rose slipped up and given police a key witness? Lindsay quite often called himself the mechanic, which was a Charles Bronson term as a hitman. You ever hear the term mechanic used outside of its normal meaning? Yeah, it's a shooter. A hitman. And he had an apprentice, which again came out of that movie. And we found out that Lindsay was bragging that he had an apprentice with him during this murder. I'm telling you this because there are times when I could use a backup. It was possible that the apprentice was the mystery man, Donnie. You do this for money? But as investigators delved into Rose's associates in order to get his identity, they heard some disturbing news. The informant had told us that Lindsay had confessed to him that he'd committed a number of other murders. There was a couple in Western Sydney and the surname started with K. And he just mentioned to the informant laughingly, I hope they enjoyed the oysters. Being given such specific information that unfortunately was so broad um, made it difficult for us. So we did a lot of research at the New South Wales State Library going through all the records of the newspapers while at the same time my partner was off having a look at the old case files of unsolved murders and sure there'd been some double murders and people had been shot but it was this information about the oysters that we were sort of looking for, this holy grail. We finally found a news clipping of unsolved murders and it showed pictures of Edward Kavanagh and Carmelita Lee. We then went back across to the old files and started to pull apart that investigation. But there was a set of photographs taken at the crime scene by the forensic investigator and uh, sure enough about the third photo I found was uh, the hallway with a bottle of oysters that were smashed and I remember looking at my mate and he looked at me and uh, we thought, well, we're on to a good thing here. The 1984 double murder of Bill Kavanagh and his de facto Carmelita Lee had remained unsolved for 12 years. When I first walked into the premises, you walk up the stairs onto a balcony that leads to the front door and just inside the front door there was two bottles of oysters. One was completely smashed and the other one was intact. That was never at any stage released to the media at the time of the murders or subsequently to that. The details of the deaths had also remained a secret. Mr Kavanagh had been shot four times, once in the forehead between the eyes. Lindsay Rose had remarked to the informant that his first shot was a really good shot and it hit him between the eyes and he was proud of that fact, which is something, again, that only perhaps the murderer would know. His wife, Carmelita Lee, she also had been shot four times at close range. It looked like it was uh, some sort of execution, professional hit, you could call it. When you look at that in comparison to the other double murder, clearly that was very, very similar to what had occurred um, some ten years later. And there was one more piece of evidence from the crime scene that left investigators in little doubt that Lindsay Rose had not been bragging. We also found some blood uh, under Bill Kavanagh's fingernails, which was later forensically examined. We didn't have DNA in 1984, but it was uh, grouped to find that it was common to less than 1.5% of the population of Australia. It was ABRH negative, and Lindsay Rose was a member. From my point of view as an investigator, this was something pretty important. Lindsay Rose has a rare blood group and Edward Kavanagh has his rare blood group under his fingernail. We're thinking, you know, here's something that we've got to jump on as quickly as we can. Lindsay Rose had formed for motor vehicle offences and false pretenses. Now it seemed he'd entered the big league without detection and his ability to fly under the police radar had just continued. We were in the strike force office with the boss and he received a call from the uh, surveillance people to say that it looked like Lindsay Rose had in some way uh, got away from them. It caused us great concern straight away because not only was uh, one of the other teams looking at him for a double murder, I had now started to kick off things and look at him for uh, something very similar. 
we were just, just flabbergasted. We really did not believe that they would lose him. But again, it, nobody's perfect. And we found out that he went into the arcade, went into a hairdresser, had his hair cut and coloured. He's a redhead and he had it coloured dark. He took his glasses off and put contact lenses on and changed his clothing. So he's actually walked out past the surveillance teams and they've just missed him. So we had to do everything we could to try and track him down. With Rose on the run, the hunt for the mechanic's apprentice was stepped up. Exhaustive investigations finally came up with a name. This is Ronald Lewis Waters. The apprentice was Ronald Waters, but he went by the, the nickname Donny. Everyone knew him as Donny. We actually interviewed him and he confessed to his part in the murder. Would you like to show and tell us what happened here on the 14th of February 1994? OK, um, we walked from the car across to here. Um, I walked up to the door. When you say we, who do you mean by Me and Lindsay Rose. Um, I walked up to the door and I knocked on the door and Lindsay was standing about there. Donnie told us during the interviews that he certainly wasn't aware that Rose was going to murder anybody. He just said that he had to get into this massage parlour and his face was well known and he would give Donnie $500 if he would just go to the door and let them see him and when they opened the door, Lindsay would come in. What happened then? Then I walked inside, because she let me inside and she was talking about the massage and whatnot. What was Lindsay doing? He was still standing there. Yes. And then Lindsay pushed past me with the gun. They were expecting Kerry to be there and she wasn't. There was an 18-year-old girl there. And he forced her up here and into this room here. Um, and there was a lounge um, and he sat her just there. And then I walked over to the window and looked out the window and there was two people, a man and a woman, walking across the road to the direction of the house. And then I heard a, like a, um, a sort of noise and around and he'd shot the girl on the chair. And then he told me to hide. Donny Waters was shocked at what had gone on. He couldn't believe that he would just cold-bloodedly murder this young girl. And that's when Kerry came to the door. And the man that was with her walked out with a rifle aimed at me and I didn't know if he was going to shoot me or not, so I punched him. And then I tackled him and sat on him as he was laying on the ground here. Lindsay um, got up me for, for hitting the bloke and for sitting on him because he was saying that the bloke that was on the ground was paying Lindsay to do the job. Um, and from what I heard, um, I'd, he was um, either the boyfriend or the husband of the, the second girl. That was the evidence that was missing in the original 1994 investigation. We now had an eyewitness who was willing to give evidence, implicating Mark Lewis and implicating Lindsay Rose. The detectives decided not to arrest Mark Lewis. While the circumstantial evidence of Kerry's blood on his rifle bag and shirt were now more compelling, police had a stronger case if Rose was to admit to being hired by Lewis. But they needed to find him first. Police feared this ramshackle property at South Wentworthville could turn into a graveyard. So in their quest to track down the contract killer, the police went public. The informant had told us that that at some stage Rose had lived at a premises and he'd secured things or hidden them um, in the subfloor area. And Lindsay had told this informant that that would be a good place to hide a body. Once home to Lindsay Rose, detectives are now digging it up to find if any murder victims are buried there. That was something that attracted a lot of media attention, so we talked about why we were at that location. The dig was ordered by a special police task force, Yandy, which is investigating up to eight unsolved murders in Sydney and on the north coast. Police want to question 42-year-old Rose over the killing of two women inside a massage parlour at West Ride three years ago. At this stage, I don't really want to speculate on, on uh, what we expect to find inside the, uh, uh, the subfloor area. 
we'd hoped that we might well have found a body or some uh, weapons, firearms or anything that might well have linked Lindsay Rose to one of these double murders. While nothing of significance was found at the site, it looked like the news report had done its job. Only minutes after the story went to air, a man called with information. He told police Lindsay Rose was in Adelaide. But what if Rose had also been watching the same report? That's probably the biggest fear of, if you know where Rose is, that he's eluded us once. I don't want to see it happen again. Lindsay Rose had been on the run for over 10 months. That was until an observant member of the public recognised his photo and contacted the Adelaide police. In a very short space of time, their surveillance police were able to um, pick up Rose and they were able to positively identify him. And the call came back to us, we've got him here, what are your instructions? The boss and uh, Rod Baker and myself saying, well, our instructions are get hold of him right now. Do you agree that uh, you were arrested uh, by South Australia Police at approximately 6.40am yesterday morning, being the 10th of April 1997? It was 5.40, but yes, I was. Oh, beg your pardon, 5.40am. To say we were ecstatic that we finally got him was an understatement. We were just overjoyed. Detectives Baker and Appleton had jumped on the first plane to Adelaide. On one hand, I'm thinking, we're going to get there and we're going to get a stone-faced person who won't give us the time of day, or we're going to get someone who wants to talk about what's occurred over the last 10 years. And uh, I can tell you that it's a strange feeling to be on your way and um, I have to prepare for the matter, so I have to go along thinking, well, he's going to talk to me and tell me everything, so if I get that one opportunity, I'm going to have to make sure I hit the mark on everything. Inspector Baker and I are making inquiries into the murders of an Edward Kavanagh and Carmelita Lee at Hoxton Park. Um, on or about the 20th of January 1984. Um, is there anything you can tell me about that? Yes, I did it. Okay, yeah. And I thought to myself, wow, there you go. Lindsay's Rose has just confessed to murdering Kavanagh and Lee. He was so direct and so matter of fact, yes, I'm the killer, I did it. Your answer to me before was, I did it. What do you mean? Can you tell me what you mean by that? I went to the house there and showed him. All right. The Asian girl was there. And um, I tied her up and gagged her so she wouldn't make any noise and waited for Bill to come home. What happened when uh, Bill Kavanagh came home? He walked up to the front door, saw me standing in the hallway and stopped. And what happened then? I shot him. Where did you shoot him? I remember correctly, I hit him there. And just describe that for me, where you mean there. Well, in the middle of the forehead. Okay, and what happened when you shot him? He uh, hit the deck. When he fell, he dropped two bottles of oysters and they smashed on the floor. The information Lindsay was giving us was just corroborating evidence that we had gathered and that the original investigators had gathered. And there was no doubt that Lindsay was the murderer. The following day, we interviewed Lindsay in relation to the Valentine's Day murders. He just readily admitted, this time, the truth about what had gone on. I was the person involved in company with a fellow by the name of Donny, and I committed the murders. Why did you shoot a fat Marosmo? So she wouldn't cause any trouble. Did you realise when you shot her, you could kill her? Yes. Did that cause you any problems? Yes. Why? Because she shouldn't have been there. What happened then? Um, Kerry walked in the door, Mark was right behind him, he had a gun. Were you surprised to see Mark Lewis? Yeah, he's not supposed to be there. What happened then? A uh, big melee broke out. She was screaming, Mark was screaming, Kerry was struggling with me, Mark was struggling with me, and Donnie was struggling with everybody. <laughs> I jumped on that bloke again and stayed on him. And then she ran up this hallway um, into that room there. This 
struggle happened all the way down the hallway and we end up in the back room. She was still saying, no, Lindsay, no, Lindsay, you've done, you've, you've, you've got me already and just don't kill me. Um, and then I heard like a, a gargling noise. Did you do anything else to her? Yeah, I stabbed her. Why did you stab her? Because Mark was um, yelling and screaming that she's not dead, she's not dead, or something like that. What happened then? I shot Kerry. When did you shoot her? In the eye, I think. He showed no remorse. He showed no uh, sense of mercy. He just related a story as it unfolded. Uh, it was quite chilling, actually. When during the melee did your glasses get broken, do you remember? No, it was just a blur. I think they fell off and someone stepped on them, or I stepped on them, or someone, I can't recall. Do you remember what part was broken? Yeah, later on, I had to buy a um, nose boost, and um, I actually got new lenses made up. Lindsay said the main reason he did the, the killing was that Mark Lewis had just harassed him for months and months about getting rid of his wife. They were having domestic problems and he just wanted to get rid of her. It was just the pressure from Mark. He said, you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And he upped the ante to 20,000. Um, that's when I decided to do it. And I just remember something. I got the gun off Mark Lewis. There you go. Mark Lewis supplied me with the weapon. Lindsay Rose was then extradited to New South Wales and charged with all four murders. Now the detectives could do what their counterparts couldn't three years before. Arrest and charge the Hollywood performing Mark Lewis. With the murder of his de facto wife and her workmate. The evidence of Donny Waters combined with DNA and scientific evidence led the jury to convict Mark Lewis of both counts of murder. He received life imprisonment for the murder of Kerry and 18 years imprisonment for the murder of Fatima. Mark Lewis is calculated as cold-blooded as Lindsay, but more of the coward type of, of person, not willing to do it himself, but quite willing for someone else to do his dirty work. Donnie was given and has served an 18-month sentence for his part in the murders. As for Lindsay Rose, he will never be released. He pleaded guilty to the two double murders and confessed to a fifth. This man killed five people and almost got away with it. Lindsay Robert Rose killed his victims in cold blood. Among his victims, Gladesville massage parlour workers Kerry Pang and Fatma Rosinal, both were shot. Edward Kavanagh and Carmelita Lee were executed in the bedroom of their Hoxton Park home. Rose's most brutal attack, though, was on Renette Holford. During a bungled robbery, she was stabbed 32 times. Five people died over a period of 10 years at the hands of Lindsay Rose. Ironically, a man the court had heard had used those same hands to save lives as an ambulance officer at the Granville train disaster. He was there for most of the time. He was one of the first ambulance officers there. He actually crawled into carriages, assisted people, uh, helped the dead and the dying, and was just an absolute hero on the day. And then to reconcile that to a serial killer and the brutality of the murders uh, just beggars belief. Did you have any involvement in Judith's death? You're joking. I got nothing to hide. I tell you now, I never killed my wife. What turned this dad into a killer? An interview with a murderer. Forensic investigators next Wednesday.